All right, back in the studio. It's time for a 49ers roster review. The way that I'm going to do this, I'm going to go through every single position group. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly after the 49ers have started one and two in what was a complicated game, to say the least, as far as evaluating the roster in Denver. Mostly excellent defensive play, mostly excellent special teams play, putrid offensive play, and now you have a lot of drama, right, conjured up by social media, people looking at some clips of Jimmy Garoppolo on the Internet. Uh, I mean, it just goes back to what I've been talking about the whole time. The 49ers need to have a productive quarterback play caller partnership. Any team with Super Bowl aspirations needs to have a productive quarterback play caller partnership. So that means that Garoppolo and Shanahan have to get on the same page. When Garoppolo and Shanahan are on the same page, the 49ers have been efficient, and it's happened every single time over the course of a whole season whenever Gar Garoppolo has been available to end the season. In 2019, the 49ers ended up with a number eight pass offense by DVOA. In 2021, they finished with a number five pass offense by DVOA. So it is no time to freak out right now. It's time to sit back, evaluate how the 49ers can get better because the Garoppolo-Shanahan partnership has produced results in the past. And I think that they've earned themselves a little bit of a, of a track record, some benefit of the doubt moving forward. We'll discuss that all as we go position by position today. So welcome in. Here's a look at the depth chart that we will be working with. If you would like to follow along, I'm going to copy and paste a link and throw it into the chat section for all of you. Maybe I answer questions later. Maybe I don't. Maybe I answer questions position by position. I don't know yet, but go ahead and check out the link that I just put there into that chat section so you can check it out. All right, so let's go position by position. Quarterback, this is what I just said, and this is what I will repeat. The Garoppolo-Shanahan partnership is the be-all, end-all of this season. The 49ers can have a great defense. They can have a solid special teams unit. They could have standout all-pro performers at different positions across the roster. But if Jimmy Garoppolo and Kyle Shanahan don't come together and perform from both of their perspectives, play calling, execution, if they don't come together in a symbiotic relationship the way that they did in 2019, the way that they did in 2021, essentially the two seasons in which Garoppolo was available at the end of those seasons, if that doesn't successfully happen, the 49ers aren't going to win the Super Bowl. Right, because they're already down to their only other legitimate quarterback option, except for uh, outside of Trey Lance, because Lance is hurt. So it's Jimmy Garoppolo. So I mean, all the Lance debates, th those can wait for the off season. Everybody wants to say, "Oh, well, what would the 49ers have done if Lance were healthy in Denver?" All this and all that. It's all stupid. Lance is not available right now. Garoppolo is who the 49ers have to work with. And Garoppolo and Shanahan is the battery that has to operate for the 49ers to move forward and make this a successful season. So obviously it wasn't a successful game for the 49ers on Sunday in Denver. Shanahan and Garoppolo both were at fault for a lot of bad things. Shanahan even came out and he said that I called some bad plays in that game. Yeah, well, no he did call some bad plays in that game. Garoppolo made some bad throws in that game, missed some open throws in that game, missed some open reads in that game, stepped on the end line in the end zone. It was a safety, and that was the best thing that happened to the 49ers on the play because right after that he threw what would have been a pick six. So, yeah, Jimmy Garoppolo played a bad game. Two things can be true at once. Shanahan and Garoppolo both did not deliver in the way that the 49ers needed to. And two things have to be true at once if the 49ers are going to be successful this year. Shanahan and Garoppolo are going to have to work in tandem at a high level to make sure that the 49ers have an offense that can complement the great defense they put onto the field. So I wrote more deeply about this today. The article's coming out tomorrow on The Athletic. It's going to come out, I think, at 2 a.m. Pacific time. So be sure to check it out. And we're going to talk, talk more deeply about this quarterback position as we – move forward with that article in tow tomorrow. So tune back in, maybe at the end of this video, once more people are on this live, I delve into the quarterback situation a little bit more deeply. But the main thing to remember is that it was just one game, right? It's one game, Jimmy Garoppolo coming off a very unusual offseason. He obviously didn't throw for months. 
didn't participate in training camp of the 49ers, didn't get a playbook until, what, a month ago? It was about a month ago that he re-signed with the 49ers on the new deal and didn't become the starting quarterback until the week of the Denver game, so just over a week ago. So, you know, all the cards were lined up for this to be an unusual start. They're very potentially could have been rust. I think that there was rust. Jimmy Garoppolo said there was rust. Shanahan has said the same thing. And, you know, even quarterbacks who aren't rusty have really bad games and all play callers who aren't rusty have really bad games. And Hey, maybe Kyle Shanahan without Mike McDaniel has to work out some of the rust too. Bottom line is both of these guys have to be better and they have 14 more chances to do it. And they're probably gonna have to do it sooner than time number 14, preferably as soon as next Monday night when the 49ers play the Rams. Remember, they had their backs up against the wall when the Rams came to town last year. Week 10, 49ers were 3-5. and five. Now, That's when Shanahan and Jimmy Garoppolo went to the anti-Aaron Donald playbook. They did it because, well, they were compromised along the offensive line last year. Mike McGlinchey had just been lost for the season against Arizona with the quad tear. Tom Compton was playing right tackle. 49ers and Shanahan and Garoppolo all agreed that getting the ball out quickly – was going to be the key to neutralizing the 49ers' disadvantage up front against Aaron Donald and company. Von Miller was on the Rams last year, too. So Garoppolo proceeded to average 2.3 seconds from snap to release against the Rams last year. That was the fastest time in the NFL all season from any quarterback. And he was ultra efficient, ultra accurate, 80 plus percent. And the 49ers just killed the Rams 31 to 10. Can they replicate that this year with likely no Trent Williams? We will see, but they better get to work and they better get to practice this year. But last season was just a great, great reminder for everybody that these things can change quickly and that the 49ers on Sunday in Denver only played one game. They didn't play their entire season, despite the fact that many people are acting like it. All right, let's move on to the running back position. That's enough for quarterbacks right now. Again, tune in tomorrow. I've got an article coming out on The Athletic in the morning on Garoppolo, Shanahan, the dynamics and everything. It's going to be a big one. And it's something that we can discuss in a dedicated video. Running back position. I'm going to make this big up on the screen. And I'm going to highlight where we're at. These are the running backs at the very top. You could zoom in. Obviously, go to the chat section if you want to see this um, on your own screen. It is an open Google Doc. So Jeff Wilson had that one excellent big run. I think it was, what, a 37-yarder for the 49ers. But the 49ers still need more especially from the run game. And everything is connected. So it's hard to just go out there and bash the run game and say, oh, they didn't run well enough because the 49ers went one for 10 on third down. I could even put that up on the screen. They went one for 10 on third down because they also struggled heavily on second down. In fact, the second down efficiency for the 49ers was a total joke in the second half. You'll see some more detailed numbers and a chart on that in the article tomorrow. So second and third downs were complete disasters, especially in the second half. 49ers do a lot of running on first down, almost more than more than almost every other team. But to me, it was really interesting because the Jeff Wilson big run in this game that accounted for most of the 49ers yardage on the ground, it came on the touchdown drive, came right after a pass. And that was the Garoppolo pass to Ayuk on that touchdown drive. I think the 49ers probably have to start thinking about setting the run up with some passing because otherwise opponents are just going to be keyed on this run game and it's going to take a diverse offense. It's going to take an offense that, again, is symbiotically working from facet to facet, so run game to pass game to make this happen. And the reason the 49ers only had 19 rushes against the Denver Broncos is because the pass game and the cohesiveness of the offense wasn't working to move the chains on third down, you only get to the 35, 40 rushes a game if you're churning on third downs, if you're moving the chains. And the 49ers didn't have many drives of more than five plays in this game. So for the run game to be better, the pass game has to be better. Situational football has to be better. But if we look at the running back depth chart, I thought Jeff Wilson ran decently well given the opportunities that he had. I just thought that Denver was at home most of this game. You got to give Denver's defense some credit. Overarching theme here. You know, as we pick apart the 49ers and all that they did wrong, the backdrop overarching theme is that Denver did a whole heck of a lot right defensively. 
And the 49ers obviously didn't have Ty Davis Price available to them. He's currently hurt, although he's not on IR. They had Marlon Mack up and dressed. Adam Schefter today reported, or yesterday reported, that Tevin Coleman would have been the 49ers' next running back past Jeff Wilson, so I'm guessing in Jordan Mason's spot, had he not had the sickle cell trade. As we remember, back in 2020 when Tevin Coleman missed some practices due to poor air quality, he has the sickle cell trade, and that meant that he couldn't play at altitude. So we might see Tevin Coleman as soon as next Monday night against the Rams, who the 49ers had a reunion with him this past week. They re-signed him after he spent 2021 with the Jets. But either way, I think it's Wilson and Coleman. So this may be a blast back to the past. And, you know, those wanting to see a little bit more of Jordan Mason, he had a carry for seven yards. You might have to wait a little bit longer based on what Adam Schefter said. But it's it's going to be the long haul for for waiting. Elijah Mitchell, he's still about seven or so weeks out for the 49ers. And Ty Davis Price with a high ankle sprain is also a few weeks out at least for the 49ers. So they have to make it work with who they have in the room. Jeff Wilson's run, the 37-yarder, was extremely impressive. It registered really high on the rushing yards over expectation from NFL Next Gen Stats. So I think Wilson's gotten faster with every passing week. Could the 49ers use the speed of a Raheem Mostert or the speed of an Elijah Mitchell? Absolutely. But again, they could probably also use Trey Lance's legs, but they're not going to get them right now because Lance is hurt. He's on IR. He's recovering. So you have to make do with what you have on the roster. And right now on the roster, the 49ers have Tevin Coleman. Schefter's report indicates that he might be up next week. And Coleman, by the way, ran better in 2021 than he did in 2020 when he was hurt a lot for the 49ers. And of course, they have Jeff Wilson, who I thought had some redeeming carries in his game against the Denver Broncos. We'll see if Marlon Mack can crack into that mix now with some more time in the system, and we'll see if Jordan Mason can keep on developing. But like it or not, the 49ers have to make it work with this group of running backs, and I do think that this is a deeper group than they have had in the past. So I wouldn't press the panic button on the run game just yet because I do think that it will look a whole lot better if Garoppolo in the pass game and Shanahan's play calling sets it up to be better, right? You have to convert those third downs to get more than 19 rushing opportunities. That is a massive, massive key for the 49ers. All right, let's talk about the wide receiver position. This was a matchup that I talked about before the game. Highlight the receivers right here. Particularly, it's guy in the top left right here, Brandon Ayuk. You know, I said Ayuk against Patrick Sertain, who's a star for the Denver Broncos, a cornerback. That was a matchup that I was going to watch. It was one of the headlining matchups of this game. Well, guess what? Sertain locked Ayuk up. Brandon Ayuk was, I mean, he made some, some plays early. There was the catch that I talked about that set up the Jeff Wilson run. Uh, then there was, I believe, one more catch there on that same drive. And obviously he scored the touchdown. And that touchdown was an impressively choreographed and executed play by the 49ers. A lot of people said it was awfully close to being a pick play, but that's why Jimmy Garoppolo had to release the ball so quickly to Brandon Ayuk, right? He got it off in 0.8 seconds, snap to release. And if you get it off quickly, the officials will say, I, I don't know if Debo Samuel touched him before or after that ball got to Ayuk. But the impressive release from Garoppolo through traffic, quick pass, got the ball in there to Brandon Ayuk for the touchdown. The 49ers never looked better on Sunday than they did on that one drive. But on so many other key plays, including a third down or two, Brandon Ayuk could not get the separation he needed from Patrick Sertain. And Sertain won that big matchup. So, I mean, Shanahan talked about it yesterday. He said, this week of practice, we work on everything because it's a cohesive offensive effort. You know, a lot of casual people are just going to be blaming the quarterback and on the side they want to simplify it, or they'll say that the 49ers didn't have – going to pass protection or whatever. I mean, all these things are true. Everybody had their faults in this game. That's why it was such a bad offensive performance, except for Trent Williams, but he got hurt. Um, but, but, but the you know, the 49ers are focusing on this holistically because they realize there are several components that have to get better. And one of the components that has to get better is Brandon Ayuk. He was not separating from Patrick Sertain in this game. I mean, Sertain was all over. And at the same time, the Broncos were ganging up on Debo Samuel. It makes you wonder why Jimmy Garoppolo forced that final pass into Debo Samuel and then was all upset about it. You saw the, the, the videos on Twitter today, but that was a force. Samuel wasn't open. 
Sertain made sure that Ayuk wasn't open. And then the times when you did have some wide open action from Debo Samuel, Jimmy Garoppolo, obviously, didn't notice him downfield. Missed, and well, one time he did hit him, but he didn't hit him in stride downfield. So as you can see, every single facet of this operation for the 49ers struggled on offense. And Ayuk, in his role, he's got to be that man-beating wide receiver. And I don't think the 49ers got enough of that against Denver. That being said, I mean, Debo still obviously made some plays. Jawan Jennings, I think you've got to be most disappointed with that one. The 49ers probably win this game if Jawan Jennings holds on to a nice pass from Jimmy Garoppolo outside the numbers downfield. You know, for all that we talk about Jimmy and his missed opportunities and his struggles, he still, I mean, the 49ers probably still win this game, and that's more of a credit to their defense and special teams. They probably still win this game if Juwan Jennings holds on to that pass near the sideline instead of bobbling it on his way out of bounds. But that was a free rusher play. Garoppolo got drilled, and he still got, he hung in there. You got to give him credit. He hung in there. He got the pass to Jennings, but Jennings wasn't able to catch it. Ray Ray McLeod had an active game. Return-wise, he almost coughed up that final kick return. That would have been bad, but he held on to it. And uh, the 49ers, you know, haven't seen much at all yet from Danny Gray in the regular season. That doesn't surprise me all too much because rookies at receiver generally takes them some time to get acclimated with the playbook, be strong enough to block in these grown man NFL games. That's just the way that the 49ers play football. So, you know, so-so from the receiving group so far. There has been some good. Jennings is obviously a really good run blocker, but uh, there has been some some bad. And Ayuk not being able to create a lot of separation and Juwan Jennings not holding on to that pass, that really hurt the 49ers in this game. Why don't we talk about the tight end position, too, while we're at it? You know, is George Kittle right here, is George Kittle in a similar boat as Jimmy Garoppolo as far as needing to work back in the game sheet? Kyle Shanahan seems to think so. He said that George Kittle, uh, you know, because he missed weeks one and two, it's going to be a little bit of a slower grind to get back to full speed. I don't think that the 49ers – utilize George Kittle in a way that optimizes what he can do on the football field. And part of that might have been by necessity in this game, right? After Trent Williams went down, the 49ers moved to max protect on, I think, like nine of 12 snaps. I'll go back and count to make sure. But whenever the 49ers have been uh, compromised in terms of pass protection and George Kittle has been available to them, they frequently use him as an added offensive tackle. Max protect, he stays in there and blocks. The problem there is that George Kittle runs a 4-5. George Kittle's got good hands. If he's in there on max protect because your offensive line is not doing the job that it should be doing, you're losing a lot of flexibility from the offense. You're, you're really crippling your offense in order to protect the quarterback. But the 49ers felt they had to do that. I mean, this was a game in which they went through three offensive tackles. So they lose a little bit of explosiveness on the George Kittle end. But – it's going to be time for a big George Kittle receiving game. If we talk about loosening up the run game, I think that's that's a prerequisite for loosening up the run game. If you're the 49ers, you have to be able to get George Kittle as a passing threat. Because if George Kittle lines up and he's a passing threat, that keeps the defense on their heels. They're not on their toes. And when the defense is on its heels, that's when Shanahan can get some of that more impressive run action going. So that was the update on the tight end position. By the way, they have an injury right now. Tyler Croft, he's got a knee right now, so he's out. He's going to be out for a few weeks. So you have Dwelly, you have Charlie Werner, right now Fumagalli on the practice squad. I still think that you're decently strong in that position as long as George Kittle is playing, but they have to take advantage of, of, of him more, and we'll see if his emergence right now as a, uh, a – legitimate option for the 49ers coming off that groin injury. We'll see if that turns into more action for George Kittle as this season progresses. Kyle Shanahan certainly expects it to. All right, offensive line. Trent Williams is hurt, so I've now highlighted him in red up here. So it's no Trent Williams, and we'll see just how good the 49ers' depth is. You guys know me, and one of my mantras is Super Bowl team has to have at least seven, preferably eight, quality playable offensive linemen. It's been the case every single season for the 49ers under Kyle Shanahan. It was absolutely the case last year, and it's going to be the case this year. And the first step toward that has already happened with Trent Williams 
landing on my injured color coded sheet. Cause I can't say that he's landed on IR yet because the 49ers haven't put him on IR. They're still trying to gauge the severity of it. You can only activate eight players from IR. So they don't want to be too liberal with that. But with Trent Williams being highlighted in pink, uh, I think it's safe to say that the 49ers depth at the offensive line will be tested. McKivitz is going to be the one that fills in for him. The 49ers see Daniel Brunskill as an interior offensive lineman. I don't think they're all too happy with Jake Brendel in this past game. He faced his stiffest test yet. DJ Jones, we all know it's tough to anchor against DJ Jones, the former 49er. Well, he made Brendel look bad early in the game. Brendel got backed into Jimmy Garoppolo by DJ Jones. DJ made the pass breakup. Um, if the 49ers aren't thrilled with Brendel, Brunskill seems to be nearing his return off of a hamstrings train. There's a chance that Brunskill takes over at center at some point for this 49ers team. We'll see what happens. The good thing about Brunskill is he's got some positional flexibility. I think the 49ers are still working with Jay, with uh, with Spencer Burford at the right guard position, uh, but he did play his worst game out of three so far in this in in the loss at Denver. And then of course he got Mike McGlinchey on the right, and McGlinchey and Burford they got picked on a little bit when Bradley Chubb lined up with Randy Gregory over the right side. Didn't, didn't end up well early on for the 49ers. In fact, I thought that, of course, Trent Williams was their best offensive lineman against Denver, but I thought their second best guy was definitely Aaron Banks. And that's good news on a bigger picture level for the 49ers, right? That's three games, three solid performances for Aaron Banks. That's absolutely something to build off of on the left side. But boy, do the 49ers need to find a way to insulate the rest of the left side where Colton McKivitz is going to be taking over for Trent Williams. The Rams aren't quite as strong up front as they were last year. Von Miller's now on Buffalo, right? So that's a break for the 49ers. But Aaron Donald, he can line up at end. He can line up at tackle. He'll try to expose wherever the 49ers might have a weakness. Now, I should say, and I have to say that the 49ers did beat the Rams last year with compromised offensive tackle situations in both games. I already mentioned that Week 10, saw the 49ers come off the Mike McGlinchey injury the week prior and beat the Rams with Tom Compton. They kicked that Rams' ass with Tom Compton at right tackle. Then week 18, they didn't have McGlinchey because this injury was a season ender. So it was Compton again at right tackle, not a good pass protector. And it was Colton McKivitz at left tackle because Trent Williams was hurt that week. And the 49ers found a way to get around it. It took a little bit of a, you know, it took a half, right? First half was ugly for the 49ers, but the second half for the 49ers, they turned it on offensively and they did it through a quick release pass game for Jimmy Garoppolo. They did it by pounding the rock. They did it by accentuating Colton McKivitz and Tom Compton's strengths last year and minimizing their weaknesses, hiding their weaknesses. And I think more of the same is going to have to happen for this offensive line to have some success and for the 49ers to be able to notch a big win against the Rams. But by no means should the Trent Williams injury mean that the 49ers are done for because they overcame it against this Rams team last year. So I've highlighted the offensive line section there for you. I think that it's just really, really key that Burford keeps on growing, that McGlinchey keeps on gelling with Burford on the right side. And now, you know, Aaron Banks is going to have to take the next step. He's had the benefit of Trent Williams next to him for his first three career starts. Well, now he's going to have to work with Colton McKivitz next to him somebody who I don't think is as good of a player as Aaron Banks at that left tackle position. So important for Banks to keep on playing well at that left guard spot, even without Trent Williams there to help. As far as Brunskill goes, we'll see what the 49ers have in store for him. But I don't think any of these other guys, I don't think they're going to be playing anytime soon if the 49ers can help it. Jalen Moore especially. He filled in for Williams at first, but then they benched him and put in Colton McKibbitt. So right now I know that the 49ers might have Six quality offensive linemen, quality enough to, to make a run if I'm counting Daniel Brunskill. It's Colton McKivitz's turn to prove that he's number seven. And I think seven's the bare minimum. And, you know, in an ideal world, you'd like to have eight of these guys really be playable along the offensive line. All right, defensive line. These guys dominated. They really did. 49ers defensive line was impressive in this game. But they did also miss Eric Armstead. It's another situation where two things can be true at once. The 49ers got a little worn down. We talked about the double teams against the, the, the tackles, and you know this is something I wrote about last week, something I talked about last week. And the wide nine, 
teams are, are going to double team your defensive tackles because they know those defensive ends are a little bit too far out to help. They'll double team those DTs and they'll try to run right up the middle. And to Denver's credit, they started to wear the 49ers down a little bit over the course of Sunday's game with some of those double teams. And I think that the absence of Eric Armstead did hurt the 49ers. Now, yes, they only gave up that one touchdown. They only gave up nine points on defense. The other two points came on the safety. So those came from Denver's defense. But, uh, you, you know, despite the fact that the overarching body of work was really good, you did see Denver start to churn out some more success late. I blame most of it on the 49ers offense. I mean, Denver got the run 70 plays and the 49ers only ran 52. Because of that, there was a big time of possessions, time of possession discrepancy. That time of possession discrepancy plays right into the Broncos' hands because of the altitude. I understand all of that, but the 49ers still have to man up and play a little bit better when the chips are down. So let's take a look at what that defensive line room looks like right now. You obviously have Armstead working on that foot injury. 49ers hope to get him back this week. Bosa's got four sacks. He's playing at an otherworldly level. I'd put him in that MVP vote right now, not as the top guy, but in the top five. I would put Bosa into that, Bosa into that MVP vote because I think this is really an impressive 49ers defense, and he's the ringleader. I think Kinlaw is playing good football for the 49ers inside. I think Ebucom is rushing the passer. And Menehu has always rushed the passer. That guy plays with his hair on fire. And Kevin Givens, Kevin Givens keeps on playing really well. So is Ridgeway. So is Drake Jackson. First career sack for him on that game technique against the Broncos. Kerry Hyder, too. I mean, all nine of these guys that I just highlighted have done good things so far this year. This is the engine of the 49ers team. But you could always use an Eric Armstead on your team. You could always use them, especially in Denver, when you're operating against a power run game. They were really going after it there with Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon up the middle, and they're running those double teams. And I think the 49ers could have used Armstead, a big end and a tackle to help them with that. All right, let's move on. Linebackers for the 49ers. Aziz Alshire, as I highlight this position group for you right now, Aziz Alshire has an MCL sprain, so he's going to be out for maybe eight weeks. So you got Warner and you have Greenlaw. Who's next? Well, Demetrius Flanagan Foles is next on the depth chart. Oren Burks is also available, but he's more of a special teams guy. If anything, I think the 49ers will probably play last three linebacker sets without their big three, with Alshire out, so you'll probably see more nickel-type defenses. But it is important for Flanagan Foles to step up when his name is called here over the next few weeks without Al Shire. This is obviously a loss that the 49ers can absorb given their linebacker depth, given the fact that I think Fred Warner is playing at a high level this year. But um, it, it, you know, can't really absorb all too much more without losing a little bit of an edge at that linebacker position. You've got to keep Warner healthy and you've got to keep Drake Greenlaw healthy moving forward. All right, defensive backfield. Now, this, this is what's exciting for the 49ers this week. The, the Rams roasted their cornerbacks in the NFC Championship game last year. Cooper Cup had over 100 receiving yards. We saw over 100 receiving yards for uh, the other side, for Odell Beckham. I mean, this was absolutely a situation last year against the Rams where the 49ers needed to go out and get a better cornerback to be their top corner in Charvarius Ward because obviously – Jason Verrett ended that season on IR. Verrett's now back. We might see him reintegrated into the lineup in week five. But for now, it's Emmanuel Mosley and Charvarius Ward doing a great job. And, I mean, Russell Wilson had to earn every single thing that he got against the secondary. There are multiple coverage sacks in the game against Denver. Charvarius Ward got beaten by uh, Cortland Sutton on the back shoulder fade there at the end to set up the winning touchdown. But there was really no way any corner could – defeat that without having cheated and known the play beforehand. You got to tip your cap to Russell Wilson because outside of that play, Charvarius Ward is playing like a big money cornerback. And that's a big deal for the 49ers. Other side, Emmanuel Mosley is playing really well. He had a gaffe in this game. He missed the tackle on Javante Williams at the one, didn't wrap up. That kind of set the, the Broncos up for a drive there that, that really cost the 49ers. But you have to be overall impressed with the coverage from both Charvarius Ward and Emmanuel Mosley. And of course, Tano Hufanga has turned into a total impact player. So Jimmy Ward's not even back yet, but we could say that the 49ers secondary 
has raised everything up a notch. And that's something to be really excited about regarding this football team. If you want to take a look at that roster, there you have it. Ward, Mosley. Oh, there's been a position change in the secondary. Diometer Lenore has taken over for Samuel Womack at the nickelback spot. Shanahan says it's because Lenore has been impressing him the past few weeks at practice. That's big. Hufanga's a starter, so is Deshaun Gibson. So I've Arius Moore right now, just a special teams guy, but he's on there for depth. Then obviously you've got George Odom, also a big specialist for the 49ers. So Lenore has taken over that nickelback spot, but I think that the main thing to take away is that these 49ers DBs are top notch. They're helping the, the rush now as much as the, the pass rush is helping them. And it used to not be that way. And it's going to be an it's just going to be such an interesting litmus test against the Rams. Again, Beckham over 100 yards last year, no longer with L.A. Cup over 100 yards in that NFC Championship game last year. Well, what a, what do what does Cup do? What what do these receivers for the Rams do against this new look 49ers secondary, which has been really really impressive so far this year? All right, let's go to special teams. Wouldn't you know it, shortly after signing a contract extension that made him the eighth highest paid punter in the game, Mitch Wisnowski is leading the 49ers to the number two DVOA ranking in punting. Now, he punted so many times the other day. There were 17 combined punts between the Broncos and the 49ers. But let me tell you what, Wisnowski was awesome in his opportunities, which was about half of those 17 punts. I mean, this guy, he was pinning Denver back. He was punting with length. He had a safety punt that got, you know, put Denver way back there. Normally safety punts will give the other team good field position. Not this time. Mitch Wisnowski has been really, really impressive for the 49ers this year. Robbie Gold hasn't had a chance to be all too impressive. He's made the kicks that have been given to him. And Ray Ray McLeod has been up and down as a returner, but let's let that sample size grow a little bit more before we're sure of exactly where the 49ers will be on special teams. For sure under new coordinator, Brian Schneider does seem that they're in better hands than they were last year under Richard Hightower of the Bears. All right, so that's a look at the 49ers' entire roster. Where and how can they fix this? Well, what do they need to fix? They're one and two. They're playing really good defense. They're playing solid special teams, and they're playing horrendous offense. So you got to fix the offensive end. How do you fix the offensive end? Well, you do this. You make sure that Garoppolo and Shanahan have a partnership that works. Garoppolo might be a little peeved over how he was treated. I think anybody would be over the course of the past year. Garoppolo also missed the offseason program There's the, and training camp. There's that component to it. But at, on the other hand, Garoppolo knows the system. He's been in the system. Shanahan knows what he has in Garoppolo. We know some of the faults of both people, one player, one coach. We can surmise about some of the other faults that Kyle Shanahan might have. End of the day, they have to make it work. They have to find a way to come together and make it work, just like Steve Young and Mike Shanahan made it work, just like Kyle Shanahan and Matt Ryan made it work. Who knows if Kyle Shanahan and Matt Ryan liked each other or you know what was going on behind the scenes there because that first year was reportedly really rough in 2015. But by 2016, Shanahan had turned Ryan into the NFL MVP. So whatever was happening there obviously worked in the case of the Atlanta Falcons. And the 49ers – need to keep on working to make this 40, this quarterback partnership happen between Jimmy Garoppolo and Kyle Shanahan. It has to happen at the level that it happened at in 2019 and 2021, or at least close to that, for the 49ers to fairly complement their defense. So that's really the overarching look at the 49ers roster. We go position by position. Maybe I answer a few questions here before I head out to dinner. Stafford doesn't run for the most part. He's no Wilson, no. And that helps because one of the big plays for Russell Wilson was a 12-yard run there to, to move the chains on that touchdown drive. But Stafford was able to dice up the 49ers against some suspect corner play last year. So Charvarius Ward, Emmanuel Mosley, time for both of those guys to step right up. David, how much of the playbook do you think Kyle had a scrap when Trey went out? He had to scrap a ton of it because Trey runs a lot. They had an entire read option, triple option playbook ready. They're not going to run a whole lot of that with Jimmy Garoppolo. Maybe as a surprise end there. But, uh, you know, I think the playbook just got bigger since last year because of all the running action for Trey Lance. 
you throw that out the window. You might use Garoppolo to throw some of the deeper passing concepts. That's why we saw the 11 air, air yards per attempt. That might have originally been – those might have originally been pass options designed for Trey Lance. I think Shanahan has almost said as much so far. I think other players have said as much. But in general, you're, you're changing to a, a different system here. And I even made a video. It's been one of my most watched videos here over the past two months. During training camp, I put out a video saying, we haven't seen the Trey Lance offense yet during training camp. And I was right about that, right? I said, Trey Lance going to run. They're not going to run him in training camp, but he's going to run during the regular season. Well, we we now have seen that Trey Lance offense, and it's definitely different than the offense they're going to have for Jimmy Garoppolo. David, do you think Kyle's afraid to give Jimmy freedom to throw down field due to a lack of trust? I don't know what it is, but I do know that there is some weird energy there. I mean, I reported on it all last week. Well, you know, we saw Garoppolo, that little clip today. I don't want to take anything out of context. I'm not going to be a lip reader. But but we do know that Garoppolo would like more freedom at the line of scrimmage. He would like to go after a little bit more, just like 2017, because he said exactly those words, right, in the press conference. And we do know that Kyle Shanahan is extremely particular about his quarterbacks. We do know that there was a little bit of a rough stretch there, even with Matt Ryan in 2015 before they turned it on in 2016. But my main point here to answer this question is I don't know exactly what's going on, if anything, but Shanahan and Garoppolo will have to get over whatever is going on, and they have to find a way to get from point A to point B. And that point A is when they sucked. Both of them sucked on Sunday against Denver Broncos. They have to get to point B, and that is where they used to be, at least. Maybe even better if they could, you know, Jimmy throwing a little bit more. Uh, you know, pushing the ball downfield a little bit more. Maybe if Jimmy has more, you know, command of the line of scrimmage, if Kyle gives him a little bit more freedom, the line of scrimmage, if Jimmy has a little bit more freedom, maybe that allows the 49ers to get the point B, which is a more efficient level than they were in 2019 and 2021. But the bottom line is that they were efficient pass offense, number eight in 2019, number five DVOA in 2021. The Shanahan Garoppolo partnership worked then. They have to make sure that they find a way that it works now. And that's what my article tomorrow on Athletics is going to be about. I'm going to delve further into it, and you can be sure that we're going to talk about it on here as well. Do I think that Jordan Mason will get carries this week? Not if Tevin Coleman is higher than him on the depth chart. Coleman didn't play because the sickle cell condition, according to Adam Schefter in Denver. So, I, uh, you know, it's tough to gauge what the 49ers are thinking about in the linebacker room, but based on what Schefter said, it would have been Wilson and Tevin Coleman last week, if not for the sickle cell condition at altitude. So I wouldn't bet on it from Jordan Mason. At this rate, Debo may be getting his rushing bonus. And color me shocked, not. I Like we said, Debo Samuel's going to run for this football team. Frank says, Shanahan needs to put uh, Jimmy back in the shotgun. Last year, when he went to 96% shotgun for 66%, Jimmy was the number one rated passer for three weeks straight. Yes, that coincided with Jimmy getting rid of the ball extremely quickly against the Rams. That, that was a, a, a shotgun move against the Rams in week 10. He could still get rid of the ball quickly, even if it's not the gun. But I think if you just stand there and deliver, it works. Now, it's tougher for them to do some of the run action. But I do think that that helped correct the 49ers season last year was the move to the gun for Jimmy Garoppolo. Now, that was after several straight weeks of devolving play from Garoppolo and the offense. I would caution people to not look too deeply into this game against the Broncos. Again, it, it was like the preseason for Garoppolo. He hadn't thrown all offseason. He had just gotten the playbook. He, I mean, he'd just taken over as a starting quarterback. We, we talked about it a few days ago. You know, Brady was bad after the layoff. Uh, you, you, essentially, everybody that's known as a great quarterback around this league was bad after their their, their layoff. Rodgers hasn't been that great yet either this year, but Burrow was bad after his appendectomy. I mean, it's it's a situation where it, it might take some time for Jimmy Garoppolo to knock some, knock off some of the rust. And anybody who's played sports before and you know has been inactive for some period of time. You know that you feel fresh and your muscles are rested when you first get back out there. But then, you know, when you get back in the gym, you're like, oh, I feel great. The soreness doesn't hit till a little bit later, till that second outing, right? When when the soreness has had a chance to hit. So I think that's what Jimmy was referring to when he was saying, yeah, I've got to get back in game shape. And then a lot of people are like, oh, well, you said it was like riding a bike in week one. It's like, yeah, have you ever played sports before? 
that first week you can hit it back and you're fresh. Everything is good. But it's that second week where stuff might start to become a slog. And I think Garoppolo is working through that wall right now. Did Marlon Mack even play? No, he did not see any action or running back. Might have seen some time on special teams. But he did dress for the 49ers. No offensive snaps. Yep, the Tampa Bay offense is terrible as well. I actually put that open on Twitter today. Tampa Bay, you know, you know, maybe I could put that up right now for you guys. Let's find it. It's a cool little chart that we could put up there. It's from Ben Baldwin's website. I'm getting burritos tonight with friends while I open this. Ben. Time is going to be up here because I'm getting hungry right now. Low on the blood sugar. All right, here we go. Team tears. Let's get this. Big up on the screen for you guys. And there we go. All right. So I'm going to have to take off your comment so you can see it. All right, so the vertical axis being higher up means your defense is performing better. The horizontal axis, left and right, being further to the right means your offense is better. Then these diagonal lines put you in different tiers. So you want to be further up and further to the right. So that means you're a balanced team. The Buffalo Bills are in tier one. They have a good offense and good defense so far. That diagonal line is the tier one division. Then you have a second diagonal line. You have Jacksonville, Philadelphia, and Kansas City in tier two. Miami, because their defense hasn't been up to par, and Baltimore as well, those are tier three teams. Tier four is Cleveland. What's funny about this year is that we have a lot of below average teams. Tier four is the 49ers, right? You have one, no, tier one, two, three, four, tier five. 49ers are tier five team. They're there with Cincinnati. They're there with Tampa Bay. They're there with Green Bay. And they're just behind Denver. It was a tier four team. And we just saw them play a one point game against Denver. So it checks out. But the 49ers are way too far to the left here for offense and offensive efficiency. But they're far up here in defensive efficiency because their defense has certainly been good. Just like Tampa Bay, which has got a really good defense. Cincinnati's playing really good defense, but Burrow hasn't been good. Tom Brady hasn't been good. Just like Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance weren't really efficient for the 49ers. So that's why the 49ers find themselves here in this upper left quadrant. The goal for the 49ers over the course of this season is going to be to keep the defense right up here, maybe even move it higher, but move to the right with the offense. If that offense, I mean, we're still early in the season, so they can make big jumps every game. If they play well for the next couple of games, you could see that offense jump right up into here, and they could be a Tier 3 team. Right where Miami is, they play Miami later this year. Maybe even a little bit higher, they play Kansas City later this year. So that's the goal for the 49ers if we want to illustrate what they need to fix. Robert Daniels, DL, you were 100% correct about Jimmy G needing a little bit more time to knock off the rust and get back to game shape. I mean, it's just obvious. And you know what's stupid? It was like, oh, that's an excuse. It's like, no, it's a reason. We're here to analyze the game. We're not here to play some stupid pissing match of excuses back and forth. It's a reason, right? Jimmy Garoppolo wasn't with the 49ers throughout this offseason. He had the surgery. He didn't have the playbook. Trey Lance, I mean, there was some rupture in continuity, regardless of how you want to frame this, right? They did move on to Trey Lance, and then Trey got hurt, and they went back to Jimmy. So how quickly did the 49ers overcome that rupture in continuity? Because it's about Shanahan and Garoppolo and the quarterback play caller tandem showing up to be the engine of this 49ers offense. It has to be the engine of a Super Bowl offense. If you don't have the quarterback play caller tandem, you don't have enough to win a Super Bowl. And the 49ers have to get Garoppolo and Shanahan clicking again. They weren't clicking last week, so we'll see if they can be clicking again moving forward. How the hell are the Jags good this year? Well, Trevor Lawrence is playing a lot better he got that first year, all the lumps out of the way in the first year while they were bad. And now he's playing a lot better. The defense has obviously also improved. So Jacksonville is a tier two team right now. Kansas City is still explosive offensively. But Kansas City is, you know, I could put this back up on the screen. 
Kansas City is still, you know, they still struggle defensively. They're above average. So that helps them be a tier two team as opposed to they used to be below average defensively. But Patrick Mahomes is going to make sure that you're over on the right. Do I think Aziz El Shire returns? Yeah, I do think he returns. It's going to be coming off an MCL. I'd say about eight weeks for Aziz Al Shire. Well, you know, and we talked about, you're talking about Garoppolo and, and Shanahan and some tension, and I'll talk about it more tomorrow. There's nothing wrong with tension in a football building. You know, a lot of people think as soon as there's drama, they're like, oh, there's something must be, you know, so off that, that this is not good. I mean, you want to talk about tension? Steve Young talks about it all the time. Back when it was him and Montana and Bill Walsh, he said Bill Walsh manufactured creative tension. He wanted that tension. He he didn't want his quarterbacks really liking him. That tension brought out the best in a group of men. And it was stressful as hell for everybody involved. But just because there's a little bit of tension right now and stuff isn't going great between Shanahan and Jimmy Garoppolo, and you can kind of tell through the press conferences that Garoppolo wants a little bit more freedom at the line. Shanahan doesn't want to have any part of that conversation, at least in front of the media. But, you know, I thought it was interesting that Shanahan came out the other day and he, and he essentially took responsibility for a few bad, bad play calls. It's something that Kyle doesn't normally do. But anyway, the tension, uh, you know, might be there. But th that doesn't mean that the 49ers can't take that weird energy and harness it into something positive. Because, you know, when men get to work, usually the best results come out of a place where there's not a lot of comfort. There's comfort. You're not delivering the work needed to get exemplary results. So, my big thing is let's see what the 49ers do with the cards they currently have moving forward. Let's see how much better this Garoppolo Shanahan cohesion can become through some of this discomfort. Because last year it definitely got better through discomfort. They're three and five last year. There was a lot of discomfort in the building last year. There was a lot of pressure on the outside. 49ers ended up blossoming. So it's a matter of what do you do with those more negative cards once they are dealt to you. Yes, quarterbacks do need to have freedom at the line of scrimmage. And I, I do think that's something that Garoppolo might think that he doesn't have enough of. You know, I'm just kind of reading between the lines. I'm looking at this, um, you know, just from an observer's perspective. And you, you, Jimmy obviously was really happy freewheeling. Belichick gave Jimmy Garoppolo some freedom at, at the line of scrimmage when he was with um, – with the New England Patriots as a backup quarterback. And I do know that the quarterbacks with the 49ers have to get the team in the right run checks and all this and all that. But as far as like pure audible capability, we don't see Garoppolo do a lot of that. Right. And I do think that, I mean, he's been in this league long enough. I do know that Kyle likes everything his way, he likes that control up there, but at some level Garoppolo and Shanahan Whatever the differences might be standing in the way of, you know, where they are right now and just symbiosis between quarterback and play caller, they're going to have to iron those out moving forward. This is a good one. Conflict often leads to understanding, but at what price? Well, uh, the 49ers have no other choice this year. Uh, you know, Lance is, Lance is the past and the future right now, right? Lance is not the present. Lance was – was the the starting quarterback to start this season. Lance will be the developmental project when he comes back from this ankle injury. Right now, the only legitimate option on the 49ers is Jimmy Garoppolo. You've got to find a make a way, a, a way to make it work with him moving forward. And I, you know, I don't know why there's not that many audibles at all. I can't firmly tell you why. And it could be because Kyle Shanahan is running a lot of the show and he doesn't want it. But I don't know. That, that's speculation. So as we, we, we just talk about freedom in this kind of myopic sense for Jimmy Garoppolo. So, you know, some people take it to mean pushing the ball further downfield. There's definitely a little bit of that. Some people take it to mean having a little bit more control to line of scrimmage. You know, just it's the whole let Jimmy cook thing. Well, uh, what exactly does that entail? It might entail a little bit more control to line of scrimmage. Either way, uh, it was something that was a theme last week because Garoppolo talked about it and Shanahan didn't want to talk about it, right? So that becomes a theme. And then the 49ers struggle in a game on Sunday. And then you're like, okay, well, what really is the deal? And then a video comes out of Garoppolo seemingly upset by one of the play calls. And, you know, 
Shanahan apologized or took blame for the play call the next day. So there's something going on here, right? There's something under the surface. There's, you know, where there's a little bit of smoke, there might be fire. Is it something that's horrifically bad for the 49ers? No, I don't think so. I think tension happens all the time between play caller and quarterback. It's just important for the 49ers to leverage it in a positive way moving forward. And yeah, and yeah, yeah, the audible, but so is it really an audible if it's just built into a play, right? A full audible, Peyton Manning like audible would be something where he could go to anything really in the playbook at that line of scrimmage. So I do know that the 49ers have two or three options when they line up. Uh, and I do know the quarterback has to pull a lot of strings again with the run game and all that. But freedom is something that is up for interpretation. Let's just put it that way at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I saw that. The enemy and, and Patrick Mahomes are arguing too. Again, creative tension. It's okay. It's something that you I think you actually want in a building. Twitter is going to go crazy anytime that you see a disagreement. I'm sure YouTube will too. And they think that any sign of drama is a sign of certain weakness. I see it as, as a sign of opportunity because this is this is alpha males working, right? This is competitive stuff. This is, you, you don't want guys that are just like passively sitting back, not yelling. In fact, if I, you know, had a takeaway, maybe one of the more encouraging signs from the game offensively for the 49ers on Sunday, it was Jimmy Garoppolo fired up after that last play. He was upset. I think that could lead to some of the creative tension that the 49ers might need to, to turn this around and make sure that this partnership is uh, going around on, on the right page. All right. Um, what else, guys? Any more questions? We went through all of this. Let's just emphasize how good the 49ers defense was. These guys, I mean, that front seven, and this was without Armstead. So they, they were getting worn down a little bit by the double teams on the inside. When they get Armstead back, oh boy, look out. Because that secondary is driving the defense as much as the as the defensive front. And that's a big, big deal because, I mean, this used to just be a rush over coverage team strictly. It is now a coverage and rush team. So, you know, in the big picture, that's just tremendous news for the 49ers because it gives them, you know, the we talked about them needing runway to develop Trey Lance this year. Well, they might need runway now to, to make sure that Jimmy Garoppolo knocks out all the rust and the hiccups. This defense has the potential to give them runway. They gave them a ton of runway against Denver. The offense just failed, right? The offense, even with all of the gaps offensively, they were still like a play away from winning that game. Defense did its job. That's great. But that doesn't mean that the defense will just stop doing its job after week three. 49ers are still going to have the benefit of this defense in week four, week five, week six, as long as guys stay healthy. And guess who's favored in 49ers Rams, by the way? The 49ers are favored by two and a half points. So everybody here is, you know, wanting to jump off the cliff on the internet, saying the 49ers are done for whatever, pack it up. The whole season was played on Sunday. Meanwhile, the Sharps, right, who dictate these lines, they have the 49ers as favorites over the Rams, who are not as good as they were last year. They lost Vaughn Miller. The, you know, the whole salary cap thing has made that roster thinner. Andrew Whitworth has retired. Uh, the Rams are worse on both fronts. Stafford is a year older, maybe a year more injured with the elbow. And obviously Odell Beckham Jr. is not there anymore um, on, on to supplement Cooper Cup. So the, the Rams, I mean, you saw it. The Rams were a, a top right team last year in, in this chart. That's why they, they won the Super Bowl. The Rams are no longer over in this area. The Rams are down here. The Rams are currently a tier below the 49ers. Now, small sample size, I get it. But L.A. is playing below average offense and just slightly above average defense. It's not this great defense and slightly above average offense that we saw last year. So there's a reason why the 49ers are favored in this game by two and a half points. And they're going to try to uh, carry that through to the final scoreboard in a really, really big, big game on Monday night. Frank says winning is something that can heal you. Enjoy every snap. The offseason is going to be long. I could, could tell you the offseason was long this past year. So enjoy the snap of this journey. If the 49ers win, all of a sudden uh, people are going to be a lot more optimistic. And it's amazing how stuff can just flip from one week to the other. That's why I just say, guys, take the big picture. You know, Montana and the 49ers, they lost a game in 88, 9-3 to three to the Raiders well into the season. 9-3. to three. That came the week after 
the 49ers blew a 23 nothing lead at Arizona. It was Phoenix back then, the Phoenix Cardinals, and lost 24 to 23. Steve Young was the quarterback of the game in which they blew the. Imagine this. Imagine this. Imagine the 49ers were around 500 halfway through the season. And Trey Lance played the Cardinals and was up 23 0, but then was the quarterback when the 49ers blew the lead and lost 24 to 23. Now imagine if Kyle Shanahan got run over by a punt gunner during the game in which they blew the 23 0 lead and somebody broke Kyle Shanahan's ribs on the play. How crazy would that be? I mean, you think this is wild, right? Okay, now imagine if Kyle Shanahan with broken ribs coached the next week against the Raiders. And Jimmy Garoppolo was back in at quarterback because he benched Trey Lance. And Garoppolo lost the game against the Raiders 9-3, to only putting up three points. Is what I said a fairy tale? Uh, did I just make all that up? No, I didn't. All of that actually happened to the 49ers back in 1988, except you could swap in different names, obviously. But Steve Young started against the Cardinals. The 49ers blew a 23-0 lead. A gunner from the Cardinals trucked Bill Walsh on the sideline. He fractured ribs during that game. So you talk about injury added to insult. Bill Walsh got hurt. Walsh made a quarterback change from Young to Joe Montana, and the 49ers promptly lost 9-3 to the Raiders at Candlestick. All of that happened. As wild as it sounds, it would completely break the internet today. Well, you know what else happened in that year? The 49ers ripped off five or six straight wins following that Raiders game. They turned it around against Washington, I believe, on Monday Night Football, and they ended up winning the Super Bowl in that 1988 season. None of this is saying that Jimmy Garoppolo is Joe Montana or Trey Lance is Steve Young or Kyle Shanahan is Bill Walsh. Only people who are either intentionally or unintentionally obtuse would actually accuse you of making those parallels. What we're saying here is that one rough spot does not determine the story of an entire season. And we can look into 49ers history to show you that even the greats have had terrible games before. And the 49ers, to their benefit, didn't play a terrible game defensively and on special teams. They actually played a really good game in those facets. So if the offense just plays to its track record in 2019, in 2021, the track record of those two years, if it plays to the, that track record this year and the defense improves, well, then the defense stays steady. Defense doesn't need to improve. The offense improves and the defense stays steady. Well, then you're going to get the 49ers moving up in the world on this. They need to move further to the right, further to the right, get over here, and all of a sudden they are contenders. All right, guys, it is going to be time for me to eat. Big article coming up tomorrow morning. Jimmy Garoppolo, Kyle Shanahan. It's a how to fix it article. How do the 49ers fix things? I'm going to be writing about that. It's already scheduled, ready to go. So I hope that you guys are ready to read it. We're going to be on with a coffee with Lombardi in the morning, breakfast with Lombardi. Maybe I bring a breakfast sandwich in onto the show. Probably not, though. Uh, maybe I post one a little bit later on. So subscribe to The Athletic. Follow on Twitter and sub to this channel because we have a lot of good stuff going as the 49ers ramp up for the Rams. All right, everybody take care. It's been good. Enjoy your Tuesday night.